Uh, I am on my second visit to Gisborne um, and uh, Kairapati uh, this year because we were up earlier and uh, we had the pleasure of going to Tolaga Bay Area School and talking to locals uh, at Uawa about this project on the tra transit of Venus. And I'd like to start a little bit of my talk today talking about that and I'll, I'll finish up with the plans we have for a major event here in Gisborne next year because I'm hoping that the eyes of New Zealand will be on this part of the world in 2012 for a reason I'll explain and maybe the eyes of the world too, who knows, we'll, 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 we'll aim for that. So I'm going to start with a little bit of a story about um, this business of the transit of Venus but the theme of my talk is about New Zealand and the opportunities we have in the future. And one of the things that really interests me is what sort of a future we're creating for our grandchildren, for our mokapuna. And, uh, and I think that often we don't think as far-sighted as we, as we might about the future of our country. And I have some ideas of my own, and I hope you'll excuse me if I talk a little bit about uh, business and economics, which is something I'm kind of new to anyway. I'm not claim to be an expert in it, but I'll give you some of my thoughts about this country. But I do want to begin with the story of astronomy, which is going to be a very important story next year. And our country was founded on astronomical observation because the great Polynesian navigators who made these remarkable journeys uh, over thousands of kilometres, backwards and forwards across the Pacific, uh, <coughs> used the stars as their primary form of navigation. They would also observe the seabirds that landed, they'd know where land was from that, and look at the pattern of the waves. But this was an extraordinary uh, un understanding of the natural world that enabled these journeys. And of course, in that they shared this tradition with the European navigators, uh, people like Cook, who used the stars. And that was one of the things that brought Cook down uh, to New Zealand in uh, 1769. The transit of Venus was a, an event that occurred in 1769. It's a strange thing. It happens about eight years apart. There was one in 1761, another one in 1769. The next one happened in the 1880s. Then we had some in the early 2000, 2004 and we have another one in 2012. It, it's the occasion when Venus passes between the Earth and the Sun, and it creates a shadow on the Sun, and uh, that shadow, if you time the duration as, it, as the Venus crosses the, the Sun's disk, you can find out something about the distance between the Earth and the Sun, and that's why Cook came down to Tahiti to measure that initially, and this photograph, is or this drawing, I should say, is completely wrong because nobody looks at the sun directly through a telescope. They certainly should. Um, the proper way to do it is the way that Jeremiah Horrocks did it back in 1638. This was the first recorded observation of the transit of Venus. You project the, the image on a wall. And you keep your eyes safe and you see this little black dot move across. So that's an interesting story. Um, <clears throat> but the transit of Venus comes about because of the fact that on certain occasions, Venus lies exactly between the Earth and the Sun at a point when the inclination of its orbit is such that it's in the same plane. And this happens as a fairly irregular basis, but because of the parallax that you see from different latitudes on the Earth, then the shadow path will be different and take different durations depending upon where you observe it. So if you observe the trends of Venus in different latitudes, you get this information. And that's why the, uh, the navigators were doing that back in the 1760s. We know about the Earth some distance now, we don't need to measure it anymore, but it has a kind of a historical significance for us. And these are the, that's the sort of history of the transits of Venus. Uh, the one that happened in 2004 was one that happened during our night time in New Zealand. So we had to look at it through sort of global media uh, broadcasts. But they happen, as I say, in eight year separations, then you have to wait about another 120 years for the next one. So the one that happens in 2012 will happen during our daylight. And this is the one where I hope that um, the eyes of New Zealand will be on Tolaga Bay. And why Tolaga Bay? Because Tolaga Bay was an also, also an important part of the history of this connection that came about. Because here we have this ship, the Endeavour, and these young men on the, this boat, these men uh, who were scientists, uh, drawers, astronomers, um, of course, you know, Cook himself was very young. He was only 41 when this boat came down. And he had some contact here, and he had some contact up the coast, but he made some significant uh, time spent in the area of Tolaga Bay, and he had quite a lot of interaction 
a lot of trading went on, and I think a lot of DNA was spliced between two peoples at that time. So it was a kind of an interesting story. But anyway, uh, it was a story of young people. And of course, we, we recognise the importance of cock ships in the Royal New Zealand Navy today as a ship called the Endeavour, and one of his later ships, the Resolution, is named in a, uh, another supply ship of the Royal New Zealand Navy. So that tradition is very important to us. Um, hello, what have I done there? <clears throat> of course, it wasn't just uh, Europeans on that boat. There was a very important Polynesian, the Polynesian chieftain Tupaya, who Cook was smart enough to bring on board. And I'm sure the locals thought that Tupaya was really the boss in charge of that boat, because he was the one who was able to communicate with the locals. Uh, this is not a picture of Tupaya. This is a picture drawn by Tupaya. I can't find a picture of Tupaya, but Tupaya drew that of some local trading that was going on in Uala. And uh, there was a young boy, not a Polynesian boy, uh, Tayata on the boat, who was a, an assistant to, uh, um, to, to, to prior. So it's a very interesting story of connections between people. This is really the beginning of our nation, the beginning of uh, a, a, an understanding and, of course, misunderstandings between people that have led us through to where we are today. Often when Cook went round the coast, he was greeted by these magnificent vessels that came out. Um, here, of course, is the place where we, we, we now think of uh, as the important beginning of that connection, although it was Cook's Cove where his... Um, his vessel was, and there is a bit of well, I love this country. My family's been for 150 years. My father's mother came from Gisborne. I want you to know that. So I have quite a connection here. Yeah. So, you know, not direct. I never knew my grandmother. She died before I was born. Actually. And um, this is an important message for us as we look forward as a nation, I think. And I think some of the questions we might ask ourselves as a country are, you know, what are the evidence base for our, uh, our social indicators and our economic well-being? How can we understand the state of our environment? How can science understanding uh, assist us in a better national conversation about where we're going as a country? Do scientific arguments affect our trade? And can we create new prosperity out of science and technology? And how can we use science to manage our resources? So why am I putting this emphasis on science? Well, it's because I'm a scientist. That's the way I look at the world. So I make no apologies for that. So part of what we're looking at next year around this celebration of a scientific event, the, uh, the, the discovery uh, of the European that uh, was preceded by the discovery of Polynesians of this country, the contact between these people and the astronomical association with the transit of Venus seen in Tahiti is really part of a motivation to think about how can science connect with New Zealand's future. And so I want to talk about New Zealand now and just say a few things about uh, where we are as a nation. And I hope you'll just forgive me for a while if I say some things that maybe seem a little unkind um, about this country that I love because I think part of what holds us back as a nation is the way we think about ourselves. And I think one, one of the things we need to do is to be a little more honest about our state so we can see where we're going in the future. <clears throat> and I don't expect you to be able to read that uh, table there. That's just to try to convince you that I got some evidence from somewhere. That's all. It actually came out of Time magazine. But it's a listing of social indicators in various OECD countries. This is the Organisation for Economic Cooperation and Development. These are the kind of richer countries that New Zealand belongs to. And there's some very interesting things that correlate in, if you look at the social indicators in those countries, and that is income disparity, the, the gap between the rich and the poor, and how that really seems to connect with negative social indicators, whether it's things like imprisonment rates or child mortality, teenage pregnancy, obesity, whatever. And there, there seems to be quite a high connection. And just to give you an example, New Zealand has, you might be surprised to know, a very, very high degree of income inequality. We often think of ourselves as being an egalitarian society, but if we ask the question, in fact, when we look, we see that we're not the egalitarian society we, we like to think we are. Uh, we are 26, that's in the bad end, out of these 33 OECD countries. The United States has a bigger income disparity, but we are up there with countries that have a big gap between the rich and the poor. And you see our prison, our prop population, our incarceration rate is very, very high. We have one of the highest rates in the world. We rank down the bottom on the scale. But there are some very positive social indicators as well. That's kind of interesting in the mix. We're considered to have a very high level of democracy. We are told we have practically no corruption in this country. We continue to come out in international surveys. It's one of the least corrupt countries in the world. And we have a very good education system. One of the really interesting things is that our kids consistently store, score well at school uh, in literacy, in maths, and in science. Now, I know we have a lot of kids at school that are missing out and uh, uh, that are somehow at risk, but uh, that's a major problem for us. But if you look at the general quality of the education system that we have, it ranks very, very well compared to the rest of the world. 
So that's the first little thing uh, that I'd like to consider the, the matter of New Zealand's inequality, which I think is a worry for us all.